everybody. Welcome to this session on uh, emergence and creation. My name is Cy Gart, and I'll be the moderator for this session. Uh, let's start. Our first speaker is Patrick Franklin, and he will be speaking on a theological proposal for reading Genesis 1 to 3 without assuming the historicity of Adam and Eve. Okay, so you've heard the title of my paper, and I'll just start by making a note that this proposal does not require a denial of historicity, but it does aim to make room for non-historical readings of Adam and Eve. I'd like to begin with a, with a question. And the question is, what is the theological motivation for affirming the historicity of Adam and Eve? My suggestion is that a major motivation and impetus for affirming this is the perceived need for a historical fall. This in turn is thought to be necessary to ground and explain the universality of sin and thus also the universal human need for salvation in Christ. Further, it is argued that the fall must be historical in order to safeguard the goodness and sovereignty of God. If a real historical Adam and Eve are responsible for abusing their free will and thus introducing sin and evil and death into the world, then God is not responsible for it. God is not the author of evil and historical fall gets God off the hook, so to speak. So this doctrine is motivated in no small part by theodicy. Let me share a couple of quotations to illustrate this connection. Uh, from Reeves and Meduemi, traditionally belief in historical sin and fall of Adam has been an essential part of Christian theodicy. That is because Adam and Eve committed the first sin at a particular point in time and so fell with all the creation that they had been appointed to rule. We can say that God did not create an inherently fallen world. He is not the author of evil. And then they go on to say on the next page, but if there was no historical Adam and no historical entry point of evil into the world, then we cannot affirm the absolute sovereignty and goodness of God, and our very Christian confidence must be shaken to its foundations. That's a fairly strong statement. Now, they're not the only ones to make this connection. Uh, I found this connection between theodicy um, and historical Adam and Eve, historical fall in a whole bunch of places. And these are just some references for that. Now, I think there's a problem with this connection. It seems to me that the traditional doctrine of original sin with a literal and or historical Adam and Eve doesn't get the theology, uh, theodicy job done effectively. Um, it doesn't get God off the hook. It, it builds a kind of puzzle, but leaves some pieces in the box, so to speak. I'd like us to consider, first of all, eschatology, uh, and specifically our glorified state. So when we are raised uh, bodily to be with Christ and transformed into his image fully and made righteous and so forth, that's what I'm talking about here. And two aspects of that glorified state in particular. One, we will be perfected, no longer capable of sinning or entering into another fall. Otherwise, we could have a pattern of fall and redemption that could go on infinitely with Christ being crucified over and over again. At the same time, though, we will also be totally and completely free. Freer, in fact, than we ever have been before. The capacity not to sin or, or lacking the capacity to sin is not actually a lack. To be able to sin is not freedom in the fullest sense because sinning is a negation of our being. And losing a negation of our being isn't actually losing something positive. In light of this, a troubling question arises. If it is possible for us to be made fully free and totally incapable of sinning, then why didn't God make us that way in the first place? I think this question reveals the failure of original sin as a fully effective theodicy. Original sin is a solution that only pushes the problem back a step where we confront a larger problem. Now, also, I think that in the theological tradition, there's some awareness of this problem. For example, James K.A. Smith, a philosopher, insists that we need to distinguish between the language of good and very good in Genesis 1 with the language of perfection that we might use. So good and very good, he argues, refers to our created state, whereas perfection refers to our eschatological glorification. Well, that's great fine and good, I would affirm that, but it doesn't answer the question, why did God do it that way? Why didn't God make us perfect to begin with? And then Donald McLeod, the Reformed theologian, 
seeks to answer the question, how is it possible that a man such as Adam, a holy man, in a perfectly ideal situation with no societal pressure, no sin or evil in the world, how is it possible for such a man to fall? And he draws on the Reformed tradition to give three answers to this question. First, the persuasiveness of Satan as depicted by the serpent. Second, the abuse of free will. And third, and most interesting for me, God withheld efficacious or restraining grace. And to unpack what that means, he draws on the 17th century reform theologian, William Ames, to define restraining grace as the strengthening and confirming grace by which the act of sinning might have been hindered and the act of obedience effected was not given to him, to Adam, and that by the certain wise and just counsel of God. And then I think it's appropriate to acknowledge that many acknowledge that the origins of human evil are finally and ultimately veiled in mystery. So going back to Reeves and Meadowamy, why the hearts of Adam and Eve should have turned to sin is of course a mystery. There we seem to be dealing with the impenetrable obscurity of darkness, the illogicality of evil. And then Daniel Haynes commenting on the theology of St. Augustine writes, in De Libero Arbitreo, Augustine plainly states that he does not know why Adam would choose a nothing, a nihil, like sin. There is not an efficient cause that it can explain the choice of disobedience rather than the good itself. All that he can say is that it must be a kind of defectivus modus. Okay, so this leads to another question. What then accounts for the difference between our present sinful state or even our created corruptible state and our future glorified state? I would suggest two things. First of all, in our future glorified state, our union with Christ is perfected. Now, we could spend a lot of time talking about union with Christ. It's a huge and important doctrine. But I'll just outline it by saying it's Trinitarian in nature. And it has to do with when Jesus talks about the Spirit, whom he's going to send to us from the Father, is going to come to be in us. And in that act of indwelling, the Spirit thereby places us in Christ, who's in the Father. If you read those passages in John noted here, just take note of all that in language, especially John 17, where Jesus prays to the Father on behalf of his followers, Father, may they be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me and I am in you, may they be in us and so be one. We can also see this in Paul's uh, use of the in Christ phrase, as well as the connections he draws and depends on that relate to indwelling in Christ. Now, an important point to make is that this union with Christ by the Spirit has always been the goal of our creation. So, whereas Genesis depicts our original creation, our glorification depends upon our union with Christ in the Spirit, where we are perfected and consummated. For example, St. Athanasius once wrote that human beings were created by nature corruptible, but destined by grace following from partaking in the word, i.e. union with Christ, to have escaped their natural state had they remained good. I would also point to the, the growing prevalence of so-called incarnation anyway theological proposals. These are proposals in which the incarnation was always part of the plan because union with Christ via the spirit was always the goal, irrespective of sin or the fall. And this is really closely related to key patristic doctrines like participation, Trinitarian participation, and theosis. Now, through this union with Christ, we come to share in a number of qualities, and I'm just going to outline two that I, I think are very important. One of which is we come to share in God's own life. Now, this is important because in theology, we sometimes say that life is, properly speaking, an attribute of God which is not simply to say that God is alive. That's rather obvious. But more importantly, to say that life belongs to God and God alone in some sense, that only God has necessary, uh, unconditioned, eternal uh, life that is self-sustaining and self-based and self-nourishing. All other life is dependent life. It's created life. It's finite life. It's not uh, immortal uh, inherently. 
It's dependent on God uh, for its source and its sustenance. And so we become, through the union with Christ, as Peter says in 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4, partakers of the divine nature. We can live forever, not because we have the goods, but because we are drawn to share in God's own life. And I want to just suggest that maybe this fulfills in some way the symbol of the tree of life promised in the Garden of Eden. Now, we also come to share, though, in God's own goodness. And like life, goodness is also a quality associated with God. As Jesus says in Mark 10 and Luke 18, only God is good. And we don't become good simply by imitating God. We become good by sharing through our union with Christ in the Spirit the very goodness that God himself is. And he shares that quality with us to transform us. And so by that union, our sanctification is complete. We grow in holiness, in goodness, and in transformed hearts via the Spirit. We also gain true wisdom. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 16, that we have, amazingly, the mind of Christ, i.e. we participate in the mind of Christ via the Spirit. And maybe this is a fulfillment of Jeremiah 31, 33, where God promised in the new covenant, I will write my law on your heart. And so perhaps this is a kind of fulfillment of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. These two symbols, once depicted outside of human beings in the new covenant, become part of our interior because the spirit indwells us. And this becomes something that changes uh, our being. Okay, the second uh, important factor, though, that accounts for this difference between our present and future states is our transformation via resurrection. And here I'm following 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 and following. Paul writes that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And he's not just talking about sinful nature here. He's talking about our earthly nature. In fact, he refers back to Genesis 2, 7, note before the fall, to refer to Adam as a representative of perishable human nature. And then he goes on to say that we need a new body, a spiritual body, he calls it. One, as Gordon Fee puts it, adapted to the new conditions of heavenly existence. This requires the transformational work of God, i.e. our resurrection. Now, as Gordon Fee explains this, he says that the earthly body belongs to the present age. The heavenly or spiritually body belongs to the life of the spirit in the age to come. There are two orders of existence here, one represented by Adam, the other represented by Christ, with the two types of bodies as the concrete representations or expressions of those two modes of existence. So what's Paul's overall point in this passage? Well, one can assume full pneumaticos, spiritual existence, only as Christ did, by resurrection, which includes a pneumaticos body. So I think in light of this eschatological re-viewing um, of creation, we can actually view scripture's plot line in two different ways. The first is the chronological or narrative plot line that most of us are accustomed to, where there's creation and then there's fall and then there's redemption. But I think there's a different way of seeing the plot and it, it retains each of these categories, but it's not chronological, it's a theological plot. Uh, kind of from God's eternal perspective, if you will. And it goes like this, following David Kelsey's work. First, God acts to create all that which is not God. Secondly, God acts to consummate, complete, perfect, finish um, all that God has created. And then thirdly, when things go off the rails and fall into sin, God intervenes in creation and brings about redemption, healing, reorientation, you know, atonement, all of those things that bring his creation back to an originally intended trajectory. So the first approach, the chronological approach might look like this, creation, fall, redemption, new creation. The theological uh, sort of plot line looks like this. You have creation and then you have consummation and you don't necessarily have a cross just yet because, um, uh, consummation is not dependent on the fall, right? We have incarnation anyway. Incarnation is always necessary to bring us into union with Christ so that we can be transformed for the new creation that God wants to make. 
Now, of course, sin is part of this picture. It's a very important part of the picture. And so the incarnation uh, has to deal with that as well. And here we have Christ's atonement in all of its depth and all of its breadth, bringing us back to this original trajectory. Okay, some quick implications for rereading Genesis 1 to 3 in light of this perspective. First of all, I'm arguing that we should read the beginning, creation, in light of the end, eschatology, and in light of the center and climax, Christology, which is to say the incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Secondly, within this perspective, it is possible to read Genesis 1 to 3 as a theological narrative of creation and sin, rather than as the historical fall of the first two individuals alone or at the headwaters of original humanity. Possible, not required. Other proposals could be um, compatible. Within this perspective, sin and evil are realities that emerge in history. The details, however, remain obscure and mysterious, and that's actually acknowledged fairly widely. As such, Genesis 1 to 3 is an inspired, revelatory, and authoritative story that tells us fundamental theological truths about God, human beings, God's intentions for creation, including us human beings, and the nature, workings, and consequences of human sin, including divine judgment and grace. What is sin then in this perspective? Well, Sin is the rebellion against God, the enthronement by a usurpation of Two human autonomy. Morning, Two minutes. Of human autonomy, will, cunning, and desire above God's sovereignty, creative purposes, wisdom, and love, which are supposed to be central to our being and existence, grounding and properly aligning our worship and allegiance, our identity, our moral and spiritual discernment. In short, God is the true, but now hidden and inaccessible by human means, source of all we are, all we have, all we do, and all that we are destined to become. Finally, Genesis 3 is a diagnosis of our condition and state. This story speaks into our human existence. Rather than explaining the causal mechanisms of the origins of sin in a modernist kind of way, it is ancient wisdom literature. Commentators have noted parallels with the book of Proverbs and the New Testament book of James. Choosing life amounts to choosing, I mean, sorry, choosing God amounts to choosing life, wisdom, love, harmony, and blessing. Choosing self amounts to choosing death, foolishness, disordered desire, chaos and discord, and divine judgment. Thank you for your attention and your attentiveness. Great. Uh, thank you, Patrick. If you wouldn't mind uh, unsharing, we can get back our screen. Okay, there's several questions. I think we will probably to at least two, but if you don't get to ask now, please stick around because we may have some time at the end of the session. Thomas Larkin, you were first. Please unmute. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that uh, very thought provoking presentation. Um, one of the arguments I've always had in my head for the historicity of uh, Adam and Eve is uh, the language Paul uses in uh, Romans and Corinthians, where he creates Christ as the antithesis of Adam. Uh, through one man, uh, all have sinned and have death. Through one man, all have life. Um, so if Adam didn't physically uh, sin and um, wasn't a historical figure, why would Christ, wouldn't there be another path that he could take um, besides the, the life, suffering, death, and resurrection in order to conquer sin and death? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And there is a lot of, uh, of course, ink spilled on what Paul does in Romans 5. Uh, I would just say that I probably am more inclined to follow uh, people like Pete Enns uh, and others uh, uh, who have suggested that um, it's not Christ who's based on Adam, it's actually the other way around, that um, Christ is fundamental for Paul and his whole exercise is to retell uh, the significance of God's election of the Jewish people in light of the coming of Jesus. And of course, Romans is really concerned with the coming together of Jews and Gentiles. 
So Paul can't just mine Israel's history for an understanding of sin. He has to posit sin back before Israel even existed in order to say that Jews and Gentiles are all in the same boat. Uh, and so I think there's a lot going on with, with his comparison. I would say he's, he's illustrating, uh, but I know that's a big, there's a whole argument there. So it's a very good question and, and very valid one. So thank you. Okay, uh, Lydia Yeager, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I I try to I still try to understand your proposal because uh, you seem to acknowledge that sin emerges in history that that after then after creation I would think, and sin is rebellion against God. So, but this is the fall. So you have sin coming into the world after creation, and it's a personal act. So why do you think that your proposal is doing away or can live without a historical fall? Well, the primary part of my proposal is, is actually negative in a sense to say that um, the traditional hope that Adam and Eve somehow explains the origins of evil, I don't think works very well. It doesn't actually get God off the hook because he could well have created us because he's going to renew us in a redeemed state as being incapable of sinning. Um, and so... Uh, I'm just trying to make room for that. I do think that there must be a kind of historical emergence of sin. Um, I don't think I would pin it to two people. Um, so, it, so I would say there has to be a kind of historical emergence of sin. Again, sin is a theological category, right? And so as we think about, you know, pre-human beings and as we think about other creatures, they're just not in the domain of sin. So the capacity to sin is something that emerges. And with that um, becomes the reality of sin. It's quite amazing how quickly sin gets introduced to the picture in the Genesis story. So it seems to be something that, that pretty fundamentally defines us. So I know there's a lot more that could be said there. Uh, so thank you for your question. Thank you, uh, Patrick, and thanks to the questioners. I think we're gonna move on. Uh